Hello, everybody. Good to see everyone. Oh, I've got mom there. Mom's joining us too. Hey, mom. <laughs> Excellent. Andy's going strong in the Omer. I like that. Dan, where oh, are, are you? You're at home right now, or is this uh, is this in in the office, or, or where are you? Um, I am at home. Um, it, yep, it's 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 a little kind of workspace that I have at home. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. I know. I, I'm so used to that one shot, kind of the side shot of you at the piano, where you oh the yes. love and all that. Right. 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 Yep. Yep. That was that's that that's our living room um kind of main hub area where uh you know when i'm doing a program there it's like okay kids you have to you go into another room and stay there for for an hour or two exactly unless you get them on the uh unless you get them on the video with you exactly right then then they're working excellent well, let's let's give maybe just a, a minute or two before we'll officially kick it off. It's good to see everybody. It's funny we're probably coming towards the home stretch of some of these now that people are getting their vaccines, and that's very True. exciting. Dan, how, many, you, how many have you done, David? I, I got I got both of mine now. Okay. Well, sorry. I meant like how many of these uh, kind of programs have you done? Oh, so um, we've done. Um, we've been doing these now for almost a full year, um, and wow. we'll do them every week. We do a couple of them. We started in the beginning. We were doing them almost every day, um, and then we went to twice a week. Um, and uh, just whenever we get a VIP guest such as yourself, you know, then we can. Uh, we can uh, uh, host them again. Nice. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. I mean, it's it's one of the silver linings I think with this, right? Is that you can just connect with people all over the world. We've had a lot of guests from Israel, you know, from right. different disciplines, from you know, different organizations, different shuls, nonprofits. It's been really interesting. It's true, and I think you know things will definitely will have changed, you know, even after things, you know, God willing are back to normal. I think, you know, Zoom is here to stay and there'll probably be some kind of component in services and other programs for, for some time to come. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I'm, I'm wondering about kind of the hybrid, what's going to happen when we go back to um, services and you know, for folks, because because now we actually have a number of um, folks that are joining us in the Zoom screen, um, Zooms that are not even in Houston. Right. So trying to figure out how that'll all work out. We're just, it's a whole new frontier. Um, well, let, let's go ahead and, and kick this off. Let's see if we can do this. Um, okay. Well, welcome everybody. We're a couple minutes past the hour to our Zoom at noon. And we have a very special guest this, um, for, for the Zoom at noon, who's a, a really wonderful friend and colleague. And um, someone when, when I first moved to Houston was a advisor and uh, a really just special person to me. Um, I, I'm honored that I got to even perform with him on a couple of occasions, um, but uh, is, is now senior cantor at the Central Synagogue in Midtown Manhattan, 
but also uh, many of us in Houston know him from um, the wonderful work that he did at Beth Israel. Um, our, our dear friend, Cantor Dan Mutlu. Thanks for being here, Dan. Thank you, and thank you, and, and, and right back at you, David. I mean, have so much admiration and respect for you um, and, and have cherished the times we've been able to do, do programs together and jumped at the chance to speak with you today. And I, and I just wanted to say to, to all of you um, joining today that how much I miss my friends in Houston. And it's really great to, to be able to connect today and to, to share a little bit. And, and you're definitely right. One of the silver linings is, is this kind of thing is just easier to do without having to jump onto a plane. Um, so, so thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's a thrill. It really is. I, I just, I said, even if nobody joins the Zoom at noon, I just said, like, I just want to talk to you for an hour anyway, because it's just been a long <laughs> time. We get to catch up and schmooze a little bit. Um, so that'll, that'll be fun. Um, how long are you, has it been now that you're in New York? So this is, I'm finishing up my fourth year, I guess, um, which is hard to believe. Time does fly. So I'll be, I'll, you know, four years. I think. That's right. Yep. Yep. 2017 is, is uh, you know, when, when uh, we started here, so. Amazing. Yeah, it's crazy. It just, um, it feels like just yesterday you were in Houston and we could just get together, whether it was for, a, you know, a concert at the J or Yom HaShoah or any of the interfaith things that we would do together or an ADL or, game. Or, or, the, or the New York bagel shop. <laughs> right, exactly. is, that, is, that, is that still around? Um, it, 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 we do still have our New York bagel shop. The, the other one that was on uh, Shepherd has moved now to a different location. Um, okay. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it misses you. Um, so I, I'm I was doing some uh, uh, research on you in, in preparation for this. I was doing my my sleuthing, and I figured out that I, I always wondered Mutlu the name actually where it came from. And um, tell me if I'm right about this. I, I read the, the name Mutlu, it's, it's a Turkish origin, is that right? Yep, that's right, yep, it's a Turkish name. It's a fairly common name in Turkey. Um, it means happy or proud. And both my parents were born in Istanbul, Turkey. And the name Mutlu has only really been in the family um, for a couple of generations. My grandfather, um, who came from Russia as a child to Turkey. His last name was Meislin. Um, and, and uh, you know, he had to change his name when he got to Turkey and they chose Mutlu because it sounded good. It does sound good. It does sound good. Um, and, and it's great because it means when I Google Mutlu, it goes straight to you on the YouTube. I'm able to find all your videos. There's no mixing up, you know, it's, it goes right to you. So um, uh, one of six children, is that right? That's right, yep, yep. We, a uh, big family, I like to think of it as like the Brady Bunch, three girls, three boys. And um, I also, whenever I mention my, my siblings in my large family, I always uh, like to say that I'm kind of a black sheep. I'm the only musician. I'm the only um, clergyman. I, uh, you know, definitely, you know, Judaism is, is, is uh, not as central to, to my siblings' lives as it is to, to mine. Um, so I kind of, you know, went my own way there, although all of us did go to an Orthodox yeshiva as children in, in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is where I grew up. Yeah, I was, so, so it was a Chabad Lubavitch, wasn't it? That's right. Yep. Chabad Lubavitch yeshiva. And I think that my parents sent us there not knowing too much of the situation, you know, schooling wise. I, I think it was, a, it was a good deal. Um, there were a lot of other um, families like my, my parents and, and, and our family who were not Orthodox themselves, but who wanted, you know, a Jewish education for their children. And uh, if you look at that school now, the, the yeshiva that I went to, it is all Orthodox. So it's, it's, it's really changed. There wasn't, there was a time when uh, there was, there was much more of a mixture of kids that were going to, 
to that school. And, uh, you know, that was the time that we were there. So I, I've always wondered, I mean, the, the few times that I'd spent a Shabbos at a Chabad house, there's so much singing that goes on. You know, it's such a big part of what goes on. They would have the Rebbe's Tish on Friday night where, you know, you're up until all hours of the night. You know, you, it was almost like you were begging to bench, you know, because it's like it's so much Zmiras were going on. Was that the same thing for you? Or was that your exposure to music came through that? For sure that, um, you know, I'm a cantor today because of my experience um, at the Chabad Lubavitch School. Um, not only because of that, but, but that um, laid a very important foundation, um, not only musically, but uh, Jewishly, you know, and, and also being steeped in Jewish text and um, studying Torah and all of that. Um, the, you know, there wasn't a cantor per se in, in that uh, shul. Um, you know, there was, there was uh, a gentleman who, you know, wasn't trained musically, but, but I think he had kind of the loudest voice. Um, so he would lead the davening. And then we had another rabbi who actually played guitar. And, and sometimes he would uh, kind of, there would be assemblies with all the children and um, he would sing songs with us and a, a lot of kind of Mashiach songs. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful for my, you know, for my uh, Chabad background, because I feel like it gives me a unique perspective, you know, as a Reformed Jew, um, especially when it comes to studying text and interpreting Torah. Um, but, uh, you know, definitely, you know, the, the, there was music. Um, we we davened every day um, as part of our routine. And, um, um, you know, it forged a very strong sense of, of and worth in communal singing uh, as a child. So even though when I went to high school, I went to a secular high school and did not have any contact with, um, you know, a Jewish school and a Jewish community, um, I went right away to find a musical community because I had been missing that from, 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 you know, from my yeshiva days. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about this because you and I share this and I never knew this about you that, um, you know, I had a similar thing. I went to a Hebrew school up until uh, uh, seventh grade. And I think for you, it was eighth grade. You were in the yeshiva. And then all of a sudden it was like getting dropped off in the secular world where, you know, you were used to davening chakras every morning at the start of school. You know, it was every, everything was done. You had all your Judaics together with the, you know, regular math and English and whatever else. But then all of a sudden you get dropped off in the secular education. Was that a, a shock for you? hundred percent. I mean, the way you're describing is, is, is completely right. It's like, it's like you're dropped into a, a, a bath, a very cold bath, you know, cause it's so different. And uh, not only is it, is it different in terms of the kids who are there, um, but but it's different in that you don't have um, that that kind of specifically Jewish community that you you know you've been with uh, throughout your schooling. Um, it, it was interesting because the in Worcester they had a high school for girls, but they didn't have program for for boys. Um, and I always wondered like what did the Orthodox boys do? You know where did they go? And and I think that you know they were farmed out to different different schools, maybe in Connecticut or, or, or something like that. But it was, it was, it was pretty shocking, you know, culturally, religiously, all of those things. And I, I really feel that music um, helped me kind of focus on, again, on those things that were important to me, you know, back, back at the yeshiva. And, um, you know, it wasn't until later that I kind of fused the two worlds, you know, of, of music and, and Judaism from my youth to, uh, to find, you know, becoming a chazan. Yeah, I so identify with you in that. I, I mean, it's, it was pretty amazing, actually, because I've been, you know, we've been friends for, for years now, but I, I don't think I ever realized there were so many similarities. You, you and I also both wanted to get into computer programming. But there was no yes. programming to be had, so we wound up getting into music more. Did that happen to you too? 
It did. Yeah. I was going to be, I was going to get into computer programming, but I, I think I was kind of like a, a C student, you know, it wouldn't have uh, really worked out that well for me, but I, f I found out, you know, that music was, was a lot more my calling. That's, that's really amazing. Wow. I, I you know, my, you know, moment happened when I was a sophomore and uh, yes, I, I really wanted to get into this computer programming elective and it wasn't, uh, it was all filled actually with juniors and seniors. And um, I had a choice between typing and, and music theory. And I didn't know anything about music. Um, and uh, I had to learn to touch type much later on because I chose music theory based solely on the fact that my guidance counselor said that um, one of my friends was in the class. And so I said, I would try it. And um, I still remember that, and I love talking about this. I still remember the first class of that music theory class. Um, the, the, the teacher, uh, his name was Jonathan Rappaport. And, and uh, um, he played in the class a Bach fugue. I didn't know what Bach was. I didn't know what a fugue was. I, I still remember the piece though, it was a Bach fugue in G minor. And he was talking about the different parts of the fugue and the different uh, musical devices while he was playing it. And it, it was quite literally as if somebody had had turned on a light in my head, you know, put, put a switch on. And I just had this moment where I was completely enraptured by the experience um, and, and right there with him. And uh, having no exposure to music theory, I started taking all these music electives and, and just kind of pushing more and more ahead uh, with sight reading and, and other classes. You, you were how old when that happened, when the light bulb went off? Um, so, so sophomore in, in, in high school, um, what is that, like 14, 15, yeah. somewhere around there? Yeah. And, and it's probably no coincidence, too, because also, I mean, you, I want to talk just about your whole vocal approach and everything. It's one thing I really respect about your singing is that you have a real classical foundation. You know, you, you didn't just just come at it from the Judaic side. You have a great, strong yuchus, you know, in the uh, Judaic side, but you also bring this classical singing approach. You studied at New England Conservatory. You can play piano. You can play guitar. You know music theory. You, you have a real classical training. Right. Yeah. I mean, I... I... Look, I, for sure, I attribute that to the path that I took initially, which was to go to a conservatory. Um, and I was just drawn to, to the theory side of things, um, you know, immediately. You know, again, from that experience I mentioned with the fugue, I wanted to learn how to do that and how to decipher that. And um, I quickly excelled in, in those theory classes. And we also had these um, district competitions, and maybe you were involved in those too, David, as a child, um, when you get into like the central districts choirs and then the all state choirs, and you're finding kids who are like you, who love music, who can sight read, who can sing um, in tune and hold their part against others. And I was doing this very, very quickly and I had no sense of how good I was or, or what my abilities were. But, but what I do remember, aside from just getting into the, to, to those groups and, and so, you know, to my surprise, you know, oh, you got a hundred percent, you were, you were perfect at your audition. It was the people around me who kept saying, Dan, you got to do this. Like you, you have this ability and you should do this. And, and it was all of that encouragement that kept me going because I, I had no sense. I didn't know what a, you know, what success really looked like. I just like to do it. And, and so the, the path was kind of already forged in a way for me to go to conservatory. Um, I loved classical music. I, I listened to classical music, you know, ever since that, that first class. And, and um, that was very much my foundation. Um, and it wasn't till, you know, after conservatory, uh, you know, I'll stop for a second, but um that I that I realized that there's this whole other side to being a cantor, aside from the classical foundation. Yeah, I want to I want to play a clip for everybody to just get to hear your singing in a second. But 
I, I remember hearing you sing for the first time um, before I think I even had come to Brith Shalom. I, when I first moved to Houston, I joined Beth Yashirin and I heard you sing, I remember it was Avinu Shabbat Shemayim you sang mm. um, at some big community-wide event and was immediately struck like that's a trained voice. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm going to play a clip that, that just from a little over a year ago and uh, Martin Kagan mentioned in, in the chat earlier uh, the night Holocaust concert that, that you sang. Um, and would love maybe if you don't mind, just could you set this up for us and tell us kind of what this project was in Hanover? Sure, yeah. Um, again, kind of another wonderful, you know, serendipitous thing in, in my life. Um, so I studied two golden age chazanim at, uh, at HUC at Hebrew Union College for my thesis um, and my final recital project. So I, I, I gravitated towards like, the, the, the golden age of, of cantorial music. And this concert, this project is, is um, uh, created by Jerry Glantz, who is the um, famous, um, he, he's the son of the famous cantor, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm blanking on his first name, Glantz. Uh, say that again. Leibel Advance? Leibel yeah, Leibel Advance. Sorry, I don't know why I'm blanking on his name. Um, and uh, the idea was to um, kind of resurrect his, his music with, with fresh orche orchestrations, but to do it against the, uh, the backdrop of, of Elie Wiesel's Night and to show that the prayers could, could elevate um, the, the readings and vice versa. And uh, I didn't know, honestly, when, when I first was approached from this project, how successful it would be. Um, I kind of, I was a little skeptical about fusing the two. And I was immediately struck when we started rehearsing for this and, and how powerful it was actually to, to um, and, and it's not like any of the readings from Night were set to music. They, they stood alone and they were almost, the music was almost commentary to to those readings and it was a way to kind of um heal in a way um after hearing some of um Wiesel's really horrific accounts and and um you know it, it i just wanted to also say that um there was another cantor who was supposed to sing on this concert and um they actually turned to me jerry jerry turned to me very last minute because it turned out that uh, the the venue that they were using for the concert in uh, Kaliningrad in Russia and also in Vilnius, Lithuania was a church. And uh, there was the, the, the synagogue in uh, Kaliningrad was actually being um, remodeled. So, so we couldn't hold a concert there. And so he chose this church and it had a beautiful acoustic and it was um, a, a really, um, you know, nice venue and, and, you know, nice capacity. I think it had, you know, 1200 or 1400 seats and um, the cantor that they chose and, and respectfully so said he couldn't, he couldn't uh, sing in a church and he, he was Orthodox and, and they asked me if I could do it. And I said, well, you know, I don't know Leibel Glantz's music, but I can, I could see what I can do. And this concert was less than a month away. And I had to completely go into immersion mode with this music and try to really um, not only learn the music, but but try to capture um, Leiva Leglantz's style. Beautiful. All right. Well, let's listen to it. That's your classical training coming in there, I'm sure, to help you learn that so quickly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll listen to, uh, I, and, I, and I'll apologize in advance because I may cut it a little short so we have room to ask you some more stuff. But um, here is an excerpt. This is the Kol Adonai from that project. Oh, 
Thank you. Wow. Dan, I just, uh, you're so amazing. What a, what a chazan you are, really. I mean, really, that's, that's incredible. I mean, somebody, you, you capture it. You really get it. It's, it's such a beautiful fusion 
of that old world, like Zuger, Chazanas, you know, where they could just rip into it and rip it apart. But yet you have this beautiful classical voice, you know, that can, you, you have the facility and, and it's the tessitura, you can just live up there in that high part of your voice. I don't know how you do it. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, it's it's so interesting. Label La Glance is a really exceptional cantor, you know, even in the golden age, because um, he has all this repertoire in the early part of his life that's in Ashkenaz. And then the later part of his life, he, after he made Aliyah, he kind of transformed his musical style along with his dialect, you know, to Sephardi and um, this, this really intense, more chromatic kind of harmony. Anyway, Jerry, his son, is not a musician, and he'll be the first to tell you that. So Jerry would would often be like, well, "Why do you have to? Uh, why do you have to sing Yechalel Ayalos Ayalos?" And I said, "Jerry, that's how your dad sang it. You know, I want to sing it. I want to sing it how your dad sang it. You know, um, because that's Ow. that's what this is all about. You know, which is trying to not only pay respect to to him." But, but to try to recreate as much as we can that experience, you know, and that magic of the golden age. It's so true. At the start of COVID, I did a series on the golden age cantors on Zoom. And um, what, each, uh, each session, we'd spend about an hour. We'd talk about maybe, you know, four or five different chazanim from the golden age. And we did a whole thing on Label of Glance. And we played his Shema Yisrael that, you know, he does when he goes to Madison Square Garden. And he just... It's just the most unusual voice, and you, and you capture it. You have that lightness in the sound too. Is that when you're listening to a chazan like that? How much of that do you feel is you're you're like channeling his sound, or how much of that is you just have to open up and let your voice kind of be the voice? Um, I, I think you know a lot of the former actually. Um, when I I mentioned that you know my my senior. A project and recital and thesis at, at HUC because that was a that was a huge growing moment for me. I I knew I wanted to focus on two golden age cantors because I was kind of deficient in in that knowledge and and uh, and and the actual execution of that style. And what I did was I listened to recordings over and over again so I could transcribe. Um, some of the orchestrations and the and the vocal lines of of music that had basically been lost. Um, so so there are great recordings out there, but um, nobody was performing them because there's no sheet music for it. Right. So I thought to myself, if if there were sheet music, then maybe more people would would perform this stuff. And I went ahead and um, you know made these kind of like critical scores. And um, actually, I think you gave me co-host status. So I'm just going to share really quickly. This was an orchestration that I um, laid out of Josef Schliski's Kadosh Ata and kind of breaking down an orchestral recording into an organ part. But what I tried to do was match his vocal style as much as possible. And you'll see all these crazy grace notes and things. And, and by doing that um, and listening over and over again, I was able to internalize the style um, and and know okay that's the Schliski signature move versus like a label Laglant signature move versus a David Reutemann signature move and um, the more you can kind of be confident that that you're um, kind of replicating their style um, the easier it became you know you, like you said you just kind of open up trust your technique and 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 uh, you know channel the cantor as much as you can. So I, I want to swing the pendulum all the way in the other direction now, because that's the, your golden age chazanas, your zuger, like that's your sirata and kvartan and label glance and all these guys, which you do so beautifully. But if that, it's sort of like, uh, you know, we just finished Pesach, so it's like the Seder, like that would have been enough for us if you could only do that, right? But you don't only do that. You also play guitar and you arrange like the big thing, of course, and, and forgive me because we have to talk about it for a few minutes. Of course, being in Houston, the Beatles services that you would sure. do at this, everybody and their brother would have to go and hear Dan Mutlu do the Beatles Friday night service at Beth Israel. Talk to us about that. Where does that come from? Did you think this up? Did you orchestrate this? Give us a little background. 
Yeah, so so if we're talking about the pendulums, right? Like on one side is is my classical, um, you know, upbringing. Maybe maybe it's kind of naturally where where I would go anyway. Um, and then um, discovering Chazanut and and applying kind of like a scientific method to it, a very mathematical approach was was all in line with stuff I've done before. But you know, the other side, which is the folk side, the pop side, um, I have to say that it that I I owe all of the of the credit to my wife Nina, who herself is a folk musician and and grew up um listening to folk music and playing folk music in colonial Williamsburg Virginia um, with her mom in in the taverns and she has a sixth sense about folk music and as a classically trained singer and musician I didn't get folk music you know before before I knew her and it took a very long time for me to really get it because it's such a different um mindset it's a different technique um, everything is different, you know, from, from the way that you pronounce the vowels and the consonants to, to the way you end phrases. And, um, so, so I only got good at that, good at that because of her, because of her kind of, um, exceptional ear and, and, and nudging me in the right direction. As far as the, the Beatles Shabbats go, um, it was my, at my first pulpit in, in Rye, New York where I had a, a little tefillah band of all volunteers from the congregation. And there were two, um, a married couple, two people in the band in particular, who had been doing this thing at the, at the congregation for a while and playing in the band. And they loved these rock Shabbats. They had a real thing for them. And most of their rock repertoire was these rewritten Beatles songs to Adon Olam or to Micha Mocha, Twist and Shout, so on and so forth. And the, <laughs> the rabbi there in Rye was not really that thrilled about it. So we could only ever do like a little bit at a time. And when I got to Houston, um, I wanted to give them credit for the idea. So I actually brought them to Houston many times to actually play in the band. Um, and I said, let's do a complete Beatles Shabbat service like we're completely unhinged every tune will be a Beatles tune we'll write some new ones um you know we'll write some new text and all of that and uh that's that's really how it happened but if it weren't for my wife's um ear and kind of guiding me in the right direction with with how to actually sing the pop stuff I would have never been able to pull it off with any kind of authenticity or 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 you know, making it seem like it was a realistic pop sound. So, so you and Nina have three delightful kids. How, how old are the kids now? Oh my gosh, it's like they're moving targets. Let's see, we got 11, who is almost 12, and his bar mitzvah is in a year, that's Saya. Uh, Dory Sue is now eight, and Jake is six. So I, I, I want to share with everybody, if, if you'll let me, uh, Dan, is, is the, uh, um, the video that you posted with the whole Mutlu crew, um, with this uh, uh, Peace Will Come, which, which I just think is the most delicious YouTube video that there must be by any cantor ever, like is, is this. So I, I just have to play this for everybody. If you want to get a sense, a little glimpse into, into Cantor Mutlu's life, this is uh, this is a great video to do it. All right, here we go. Even the name is great. The Mootloos. It's just I would buy that record. Good, good. 
my soul, let it bring peace, sweet peace, peace will come, and let it begin with me. That's so delightful. I love that. Ever see everybody in the Zoom call has a big smile right now. I'm just looking around and seeing it. It's, you can't help but to feel great after that. How many takes? How many takes did that require for you to get everybody to stand and you know do it all? And so so that um, was actually recorded live, um, and that was part of our um, we we did the coffee with clergy program. Um, and I think, uh, how many did our family do eight or nine? And, and it was, it was a truly a pandemic, um, you know, venture and, and undertaking. Um, we did, I, th I guess there was eight live shows and, uh, you know, the rehearsal and the prep that goes into them is, is, is incredible. But what was more incredible was the willingness of our kids to, to be a part of it. I mean, they really loved it. And we kind of took advantage of the fact that we were all home and there was this big need in the community um, for, for content. You know, most people were home and they didn't have anything going on around noon. Um, things are different now. People can go out, you know, people are getting vaccinated um, and there's a lot more programming too out there, but, but uh, we saw it as like really serving a, a, a particular need in the community. So, so I knew this would happen. I would. I, I know I'm going to wind up having a million more questions than I have time with you to ask them. Um, but I, so I'm just going to say for everybody on the Zoom call, in the next few minutes, I'm going to open it up for people to chime in with their questions. So get your questions ready. I, I want to talk to you, uh, Dan, for a minute just about your work uh, now as an educator also, because you've now really come full circle. You know, and you were talking about your own training at NEC and then going to Hebrew Union College. So you're now on the faculty at the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music. You teach and give back and train other cantors. Um, how, did that, how did that first come about? Were you approached by them? Was this something you sought out and had an interest in yourself? Yeah, um, so I actually got to do this very early on. Um, again, it was, it was uh, a stroke of great luck and also, um, you know, you know, having having the right connections, I would say. Um, there's there's a gentleman. His name is Ralph Selig, and he's um, a real expert 
on German classical reform music. And we met early on in my cantorial training. And, um, you know, I recorded a, a, an album with him, you know, again, in Ashkenaz with all of this stuff. And he, he was the one who kept on saying, you should teach at HUC, you should teach at HUC. So in 2011, he um, asked the then director of the School of Sacred Music, Bruce Rubin, um, if, if, uh, if he would give me a shot at, at, uh, at teaching. And he said, Dan Mutlu, the guy who would wear his baseball cap all the time at, uh, you know, at school and, you know, and, you know, and, and Ralph's like, yeah, that guy, you got to give him a chance to teach. And um, he gave me a chance. And it was, it was kind of like all over again at school, like you said, going full circle, um, where I'd been given a chance and I was, I was really encouraged. And so I, I, I put everything I had into it and um, I started teaching. And even after I went to, to uh, Houston, I continued to teach through the certification program. Um, with mainly online teaching before Zoom was, was really a big hit and uh, coming into New York a few times a year for the in-person stuff. And uh, I knew that when I got back to New York from Houston, one of the, one of the things I wanted to get into right away was, was teaching again, because I really, really love to teach. I think it's important. I think that um, it's, it's critical to demystify Chazanut in particular and, and, and cantorial arts to students because you can learn it, you know? And I think, I think for a lot of students, it just feels like this great mystery that they'll never be able to acquire, you know, or achieve. And, and um, part of my, my mission is to, you know, bring that to people and, and show them that they can do it as well. It must be wild for you. Cause I mean, you're, you're a young guy and to have graduated HUC, I mean, not too long ago, there must be folks on the faculty there that were on the faculty when you were a student. Oh, 100%. Yep. I mean, Absolutely. is it weird dynamics? Is it like, do they still view you as a, as a student in a way and pinch your cheeks kind of thing? Um, you know, amazingly, no. It's like, it's it, it, the amount of um, respect that, that I feel on, on, on their end is really like, I'm so grateful for it because, and, and you know, I mean, they always were you know, we're wonderful faculty. It's just, you know, when I was a student, I was a student, I was running around like a headless chicken, like between um, choir jobs and my, my weekend pulpit and school and, and other things. And I was telling a student this actually today, I said, you know, in many ways, you're going to be busier now as a student than you are when you, when you, you know, get a full-time job, because at least you'll be able to consolidate all your energy into one place. Um, whereas a student, you're, 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 you know, you're a full-time student and you have all these other things going on trying to make ends meet. And uh, they, they were just always respect, respectful and wonderful. And um, I, I, I still feel like, you know, amazed at, at, at uh, how easily and quickly it was for me to become kind of one with, with the faculty. Yeah, deser deservedly so too, Dan. I mean, I, I, not a lot of people on this call probably know this, but when I first got to Houston, you were one of the first people I just looked up and called. And we just, because I knew you were a cantor in town and you were well-respected and I, I just didn't know anybody in town. This is long before I set foot in Brith Shalom. And I just called you up and said, hey, I want to do some Jewish concerts in Houston. Who do I call? What do I do? And you introduced me then to Marilyn Hassett at the J and I started doing concerts there. And then from there, when it was time, I, uh, you know, to, to step into the role at, at Brith Shalom, you were the person I called to, you know, ask your advice and how do I go through this? And so you always had that generous spirit of helping people on their path. You know, a lot of cantors, uh, you know, sometimes deservedly, sometimes not deservedly have a reputation of kind of having big egos and, you know, big personalities, but that's not you. You're just this really down to earth guy. And, I just, I think you're the best. I'm a, I'm a huge <laughs> of Dan Mulu. I'll come and listen to you, Javin, any day of the week. I'm a big fan. Um, so hey, thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate that. And I remember our first meeting um, yeah. and, and uh, you know, uh, I had great respect for where you came from and your, you know, your training and background. Um, and I was so excited, you know, for, for the city of Houston that uh, somebody as talented as you were, 
you know, just kind of getting started in the Jewish world there. And, and uh, you know, it, it, was a, it was a mutual feeling. Well, thanks. Your, your, your check's in the mail for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I promised I'd um, open it up. If anybody has any questions in particular, now is your chance for Dan Mootloo of the Mootloos. He is here live on the Zoom call. Uh, Charles, I see you've got, you want to come off mute and uh, ask your question? Sorry, Charles, you're on mute. Uh, you have to unmute if you want to hop in. There you, there you <clears throat> the first thing I want to say is that I never, <clears throat> sorry, I never forgot my promise to go listen to Daniel at Central Synagogue. It's just with this known traveling that we uh, are. And the other thing is, why don't we do this every week, once a week? Zoom at noon? Why don't we do Zoom at noon? Well, I think we have been doing these on a weekly basis. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we don't always get a guest as, uh, as amazing as Cantor Dan Mutlu. There's, they, don't, they don't grow on trees. Also. Yeah. Yeah. Cantor well, Mutlu, we'll, we'll, this we'll is Hannah, oh, this well, is ahead, Hannah Martin. And I want to say thank you for every night that you were at Beth Israel. I enjoyed your immensely. Now I click in at five o'clock and hear you at Central Synagogue. So again, thank you for the richness of your voice and thank you for the richness of your synagogue. But to David Crone and to Cantor Mutley, Beth Israel now has an opening. The star, uh, Cantor Star is leaving. So both of you are welcome to try out and come back. <laughs> Good luck to both of you. I love you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I was going to say to Charles and to you, uh, you know, thank you for, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that you, you tune into Central and anytime you're in town, come, you know, and we're all opened up, which hopefully is going to be very soon, you know, come visit us, come say hello. Um, and I did see that. I did see that um, Star Trumpeter is, is leaving Beth Israel. And I, I, you know, obviously there's a very a special place in my heart for for Houston and and especially Beth Israel and I I you know really wish them the best and hope they get the candidate they deserve. So um, oh, no, please, uh, I I just want to say I I heard the night concert I saw Mart Martin also do did I'm I've been listening to a lot of the Cantor's Assembly the song swap so I missed the last one so I'm waiting for the recording with with um. Carl Bach's daughter, um, and um, it was amazing. The concert was just spectacular. Um, and I just wondered, um, so the mixture of folk, and I, I see a lot of the more contemporary, younger can uh, cantors seem to be more educated in the Debbie Friedman style, which I love, okay, than the classic cantorial is, is, is is that an issue today or is it um, something you could be concerned yeah. about? Because they're both important. I, I think it's a really great question and there are a lot of reasons for it. And I'll try to try to answer this question very quickly. Um, you good know, luck. The, <laughs> the, right, you know, good luck. You know, the cantorial music and, and Eastern European chazanut it is not the music of, of our time, right? We don't grow up listening to that. So it takes an incredible amount of effort to internalize and to, um, to learn the style. And, and David knows that, uh, you know, back in the day, this was an oral tradition. You know, you didn't have sheet music or anything like that. You listen to your chazan do the same phrase over and over and over again. And you copied and you mimicked until you got it right which is why I immersed myself in the recordings and tried to, um, um, you know, tried to transcribe things. Folk music, on the other hand, and pop music is the music of our time. So, you know, it stands to reason that it's gonna be much easier for, for somebody to access that part of their, you know, musical vocabulary because it's all around them. It's, it's like speaking English to them. Now, in terms of kind of what's important, obviously both are important. But but what is what is threatened is is the cantorial music because it's much harder to get to, and um, it, it's also harder for congregants to appreciate. Right? 
um, it, it takes a, not only a great deal of effort to, to learn it and to pull it off well, but it takes an additional amount of effort to sell the congregation on, on that sound. And, and, and um, you have to craft and you have to weave the music and you have to, you have to uh, make it enticing and palatable and all of that stuff. And, and so um, I, I think HUC, and I can only speak to HUC because I, I only teach there, you know, is, is thinking about this intensely and how can we train cantors, not only so they're, they're authentic in, in doing the chazanut, but also presenting it to their congregations in a way that, um, you know, is palatable and exciting instead of like a museum piece, you know, because I don't see it as a museum piece. I see it as a living, breathing thing. Yeah, Dan, I, I love what you just said. I, I think back to the concert that you did at Beth Israel. Um, I guess this is going back maybe five, six years at least with uh, uh, you had Cantor uh, Mendelssohn, Jack Mendelssohn come to right. And when you teamed up with him and he created a whole, um, like a whole performance piece. You know, it wasn't just that he got up and did, you know, I don't know, Elohad Shalom Atsarti or something like he, he did a whole funny kind of shtick with it. And he talked about when he went to train with this old Chazan and he had a salami that he took a bite of. And then he said, here's how you sing, take a bite of salami. And then you'll say, and it, it became like this living, breathing thing. What was that like to work with, with Mendelssohn? I mean, he is, he's talk about a repository of the golden age cantors. I mean, he's the guy. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, he, he is the guy and, you know, he inspired me in so many ways. The, the obvious being, you know, his legendary status and, and his voice and uh, his chops. But, but what uh, a lot of people don't know about him is what an excellent teacher he is and how he was able to demystify um, the cantorial moves. And I saw him doing that in, in, in classes, you know, and I said, this guy is, is a fantastic teacher. He wants everybody to be able to do Chazanut. Um, and uh, so I, I remember vividly when I first started working with, with, with him and then he was my cantorial coach. And, uh, you know, the respect he had for, for me and the encouragement he had for me was just, um, you know, put me over the top because, you know, he's, he really is one of the greats. And, uh, you know, he still teaches at HUC. We still run into each other. Um, and it was incredible working with him at Beth Israel and his program that you mentioned, the, the Cantor's Couch, is, is really exactly that. Like it's not only a look into his life and, and, and kind of set to a musical, but it's a way to bring Chazanut again to the masses. You know, let's bring Chazanut to people because it is something so special that we can share with, you know, with Jews and non-Jews alike. I want to end up our hour together with um, just a little more of your voice if I could. Um, and I have one more clip that was from Central Synagogue where you took Kol Nidre, the Rusotto arrangement of it, and you arranged it. I don't know if you arranged it this way, Dan, or this is something you acquired from someone else, but you had a whole ensemble there. I mean, with the, with the choir doing some of it, but then you took on some of the choir voices and then you had string instruments doing some different things. And it just, it was so unique the way you did that. How did that come about and set, set up this clip for us? Sure, well, all credit goes to our music director at Central Synagogue, Dave Strickland, who's an amazing guy and a really wonderful friend. Um, somebody I've known since uh, graduating from HUC um, and, and uh, he's an incredible arranger, incredible musician. He, he really understands worship. Um, and, and he arranged this, this, you know, the risotto for, for strings and choir and cello and, and all of that. And uh, we just have a wonderful musical team at Central too, who can kind of make the magic happen. But uh, this is our, it's, this is our signature Kol Nidre for, for the holidays. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's an just incredible feeling of, of, of respect and grandeur and 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 just place in 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 time and in space when you sing Kol Nidre at Central. Um, you know, even last year with uh, no congregants in the shul, we had pre-recorded um, folks taking out the Torahs from the Ark and holding the Torahs. It was just incredibly, incredibly meaningful. So, but that's that's how this arrangement came to be. Excellent. Thank you, Dan.
And um, I'll also just, because uh, we'll wind up uh, closing out with this clip, because I know you have to run here on the hour. Um, we're grateful to get an hour of your time. We know you're a senior cantor, but you've also taken on interim rabbi at a few different points, and there's been all kinds of stuff going on in New York with you. So um, just really grateful to get this time with you and looking forward to seeing you in person as soon as it's safe to do it. Absolutely, me too. And thank you for, for, for the time here and, and uh, so great to see, see my Houston friends here. Okay. Sorry to cut us short in the middle of that clip. Um, we're past the hour. The full thing, you can find it on YouTube, and I hope you'll go and check it out, as well as uh, uh, stream some of uh, Cantor Dan Mulu's services, Central Synagogue. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and, and thank you again, Dan. It's just great, great, great to see you. Thank you as well, David. Great to see everybody. This was really a pleasurable hour. It was, it was so nice to be here. Take care, we'll be in touch. Thank you.